Um, thank you, worship team. You know, uh, you guys are doing it for the Lord. I get that, but I don't think we give you enough credit. You guys are fantastic. You operate well under all circumstances. Thank you. And let's also uh, thank the kids' church teachers who are not even here to hear it because they're so dedicated. They take those uh, little blessings back to the back. And um, little blessings, what? That's what I meant. And so a uh, word of appreciation to them as well. All right, so PK obviously is not here. He will be doing Revelation next week when he comes in. We're going to do a uh, sort of a brief intermission like we often do between books. We're going to look at a, a handful of verses, eight to be specific. Um, but these eight are Paul's eight. So they're uh, not complicated in theme, but they're complicated in arrangement. It really took me a long time to figure out how I was going to preach this message. I graphed it. I charted it. I cut out little pieces of paper and rearranged them. I kid you not. It was just a feedback loop of ideas interconnecting with themselves and all referencing themselves. And it was complicated in structure. So I've decided to go, obviously, with PowerPoint. And this has turned out to be a better way of doing it, I think. So prepare for death by PowerPoint, my other speciality. But first, uh, well, our text for today, as you can see, is in 2 Corinthians, um, chapter 5 is where we'll be starting, and we'll go a little bit into verse six, or chapter 6, and you'll see why. So, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, starting in verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you. On behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, now is the day where we come before you to learn what it is you would speak to us. I pray that our hearts are open and our minds are awake. Let our spirits receive your word. Let there be no obstacle to stand in our way of understanding. Lord, may we submit ourselves to your will and to your authority as our Savior, as our King, as our Father, as our God. In your name, Jesus, amen. All right, a favorable time. I realized in my various attempts to organize this that the first thing that we had to do was get a little sort of scholarly groundwork out of the way. It's not going to be too laborious, I hope, but bear with me. The first thing we're going to go over is vocabulary. <laughs> vocabulary. All right, there are some key words that many of you probably know, some of you may not. And I just want to make sure that we all have a, co a common frame of reference because these words are going to be necessary to really unlock some of what Paul's talking about here. All right, our first word is going to be justify, the root of justification as well. This is when we are free from the penalty of sin. As you can see, you can read that as well as I. It's to declare righteous, morally and legally, innocent in the eyes of God. Notice, it's not to be innocent, as such, inherently, God declares you righteous. Now, it could be because you are, in fact, righteous. Like, if you are justified in the eyes of other men, maybe it's because you're innocent of the crime. But if you have done somebody wrong, and that person says, I do not hold it against you. You are innocent in my eyes. He has justified you, where you were not justified initially. Pretty simple, right? Simple in concept, but profound in application. Because every sin we commit, whether it's against our own bodies or against another human, 
is ultimately a sin against our and their creator. All sins are first and foremost sins against God, the perfect one who created you, who gave you every breath. Every time we sin, we spit in our master's face. So he's the ultimate forgiving authority. This is why we turn to him for forgiveness, because he's the one who's been wronged. He's the victim here. So he frees us from the penalty of sin to declare righteous. The other word we often use for this, the more common word, is salvation. This is when you offer yourself up and say, Lord, please come into my life. Forgive my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I submit myself to you. This is that, that act that's so famous, and rightfully so, when the dead come alive. Justification is salvation. It's also referenced as reconciliation to a certain extent. Um, there's more to that word than this, but it certainly is when you're dead in your sins, in your trespasses, committed, you're guilty of the crimes you've committed, and God comes and stands in the way for you and says, no, I'll bear that price. He reconciles himself to repair a broken relationship. But keep this in mind. It's not just broken. See, this laser potent works. Sweet! It works. It's not just broken because of sin. Yeah, yeah, I know you like the laser. It's broken because of hostility. Was God hostile to us? No, God so loved the world, right? Whose hostility was this? That's right. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. If I like something else better than you, God, you're my enemy. I'm working against you. That's what you call somebody who works against you, your enemy. You might not view yourself as theirs, but if they're working against you, whether you like it or not, they're your enemy. Therefore, when we work against God's design for our life, we are making ourselves his enemy. And I can't recommend that as a course of action. Okay, next. Sanctify. The first one, justify, free from the penalty of sin. Sanctify is free from the power of sin. To make holy, set apart. The sanctum, the inner sanctum. Dedicated to God's service. These are the holy objects of the temple, the temple itself, the offerings made on the temple. All right, this is when God sets you apart. He makes you in a process continually different one day after another. This is after the salvation experience. We have the sanctification experience. This is also called discipleship. The Christian walk with God that produces greater obedience, greater relationship, and greater spiritual fruit, while sin continually loses its power over the believer. Another way of looking at this is the process of being made perfect. He is perfecting you. You will not reach it in this life, but you will be getting closer to it every day is the idea and the event if we submit to it. This is a powerful time. In the Christian life, the justification portion can happen in an instant. You don't keep repeating that. It's done. Christ says it is finished. This, this is where you are supposed to be spending. There it is. Whoa, I did it. Now I broke it. There we go. But second, vocabulary. All right, there it is. This is where you're supposed to be spending every day of your life until you die. This is Christianity while you're here on this earth. If you are not a Christian, go back to the, first, the earlier slide. If you are a Christian, good job getting saved. Now we're here. This is important, and I'll come back to this because this is everything about our Christian walk. All right, sin is losing its power over the process. As we increase in holiness, as we increase in righteousness, as God does this in us, this is the work that God is doing. This is key to remember. We're not being better behaved through our own strength. We are allowing him to make us different inside, and then we are acting better behaved through an exercise of our free will, empowered by him. We are involved together. God chooses to work together with us. That part, I don't know why. I wouldn't work with me. Thankfully, he doesn't take my advice. All right. Next vocabulary word. This is a good one. Free from the presence of sin. All right. So justify. Free from the penalty of sin. We're no longer under the curse of death. Sanctify. Free from the power of sin. Sin is losing its power over us. And glorified. We are free from the presence of sin. It's not even around us. We couldn't sin if we wanted to. It's gone. 
To glorify is to give glory, to give honor, to give splendor, wealth, dignity, high position. This is also called going to heaven. There's no fancy word for that. It's going to heaven. This is the promised by God and looked for by us hope of eternity with God where suffering, death, and sin are gone forever. It's not that we're just so well behaved, sin doesn't tempt us. There is no more sin to tempt us. There is no more death. There is no more decay. There is no more entropy. There is no more suffering. There is no more loss. There is no more wishing and wanting and hoping and dreaming. It's a present now. We can't really comprehend that. It's something that we have to take on faith at this point in our life. But it's not something we have to take entirely on faith. Here's what I like about this. This is worth spending a little bit of time on. The Holy Spirit throughout Scripture is referenced by very many different names. But one of them I like is he's called the down payment. The earnest money. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. You're bought with a price, God says. See, here's the thing. To understand Christ's death and resurrection in the, in the ancient Near East way, in the, old, in the Old and New Testament way, you need to understand that we're slaves. You are slaves. You will always be a slave. You are either a slave to the God of this age, a slave to Satan, a slave to sin, or you're a slave to God. Here's what Satan says. I'm your master, and I demand that you do whatever you want. God says, no, I want you to do what I do. Okay? You have two choices. Is there a third choice? Can you think of a third choice? You're either going to do what God says or not what God says. Satan wants you to do what not God says. Therefore, if you do that, you're Satan's slave. It's kind of an escapable logic. Don't mind my grammar. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> so God says, well, you were a slave over here with this hostile master who tortured you. I'm going to buy you to bring you into my home and love you like a son and a daughter. I do own you, yes, but you are my son. You are my daughter. I have bought you in order to rescue you. How did I buy you? I stood in your place. I went to go die for you. When that salvation process occurs, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. God himself is here right now, as you all know, inside of you. What does that mean? That means he's promised me heaven. I can't see it yet. But since I have the eternal creator moving and living inside of me and I can experience that presence, I have really good reason to believe he's going to follow through on his promises because he's here right now. He's comforting me right now. He's encouraging me. He's giving me the words. He's protecting me from evil. He's helping me fight the sin I could never fight before. God is working in me at this present moment. Why would I not trust he would continue to do so when he is doing so right now? Keep that in mind in those long, dark watches of the night when you begin to fear or doubt or wonder, is God here now? Do I feel his presence now? Yes. Then don't doubt his promises. He's paying out right now with his presence. That is a reason to believe. A marriage relationship, which is a prophecy of Christianity, a marriage relationship requires a measure of faith. I can see you're here now. I remember you saying I do. I can observe you doing the things that care for me as I do the things that care for you. There is a present reality that gives great weight to your promise that tomorrow you will also do the same. Do I know with certainty? No, but I have a very great weight of evidence to trust you that you will be there for me tomorrow. How much more so God who never lies? He promises us glory in heaven, but he gives us his presence now, so keep that in mind. I'm not going to spend much more time on this because it comes up a few more times, but again, sanctify, sanctification, discipleship. This is where we need to be spending most of our time. All right, the process is fairly simple. If the uh, clicker is not, there we go. First, you are justified. You are saved, freed from the, from the penalty of sin. God has paid your price. You are now cleansed judicially, morally. God says, I don't hold any wrong against you. Let us be reconciled together. Let us be back in relationship. That relationship with God, God walking inside you and you walking with him, produces greater and greater purity. You're becoming sanctified. This is critical for our today. Eventually, when he comes to get us or we go to him, we will be glorified. That's the final stage. Some people say you could probably skip this, like the thief on the cross was justified, then he died. I bet you there was some measure of this, however briefly. All right, he became a better person for being around God, around Jesus. And however long he hung on that cross, I think, was a better time than the time he hung on that cross before it. We're not given that record. But since you're all still alive and breathing, for those of you who are saved, 
this is where you are. That's my evidence. You're still breathing. If anyone is not breathing, raise your hand. That's way too many. <laughs> All right, we're almost done with vocab words. A couple more. These ones are going to be quick. Whoops, I pressed it twice. It's going to go past it. Awakening. This is from the body sense to rouse from sleep by the quickening of one's conscious mind in response to some stimulus. Whether internal or external, you just wake up. All right, we know that one. In spirit, it's to rouse from spiritual death by the quickening of one's spirit in response to the Holy Spirit. This is another name for the salvation experience. All right. Believers aren't awakened as such. They go through revival, which is our next word. The non-believers, the great awakening, occurred when a bunch of lost people found Jesus. Okay. Our job is to help encourage awakening in others, for those of us who are saved. If you are not saved, this is what you should be doing. Revival is, in the bodily sense, to bring back to biological life or consciousness through natural or medical means. A person can be revived by food or drink. They can be revived after a nice night's sleep. Or they can be literally revived if their heart stopped and they get the uh, you know, clear. There's multiple levels of that. But in a spiritual sense, this is key for us as well here in the, in the um, sanctification phrase. The refreshment and reinvigoration of returning to relationship, returning to relationship with God, manifesting in internal and external positive change. If you have neglected sanctification, if you are neglecting sanctification, then you need revival. You're basically dying out. You're dusty. You're bleeding. You maybe don't even notice. If you want to be freed from the power of sin, if you want to grow in holiness and righteousness, you must be revived continually. If my people who are called by my names will humble themselves and admit they need it, will pray and ask for it, will seek his face to desire relationship, and will turn from their wicked ways because you can't have your cake and eat it too, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins. If you do this, then I will do this, God says. Action is required. All right. Enough about that. Let's get into the meat of this. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. This is fairly simple. This basically means there's more going on than meets the eye. The meat that we wear is ultimately irrelevant. It influences our spirit, yes. But this is not, this outside earth suit is not the part that is necessary to judge. All right, money, fame, good looks, friendliness, happy smile, outward pleasantness. These things may be indicators of the internal state. They may not. But from God's point of view and us as God's workers, it's ultimately irrelevant. We regarded Christ according to the flesh. The disciples did. You know, recorded in John's gospel all the time. They're mixing up what he was here for and who he was. But not anymore. Now they know who Jesus is. We used to regard y'all, used to regard everyone as just another human. But you are eternal souls brothers and sisters in Christ, meeting future brothers and sisters in Christ, or the damned who don't even know it yet. This has great and incredible weight. Do not regard according to the flesh. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You could spend years on this verse. I'm only going to spend a few minutes. This is freedom in Christ. That old person, the one who betrayed you, the one who set you up for failure, the one who acted evilly towards others, the one who's full of shame and guilt and fear and anger and lust and desire and wrath, they're dead. They're dead. We might try to pick up the corpse like Weekend at Bernie's and go frolicking around, but it never works, right? <laughs> weekend at Bernie's reference. It's holy. I just made it that way. <laughs> Not, not uh, we can do that, Bernie's. Um, but he's dead. Think about that. All of your pain of your childhood, do you still feel it? Yes. But it doesn't own you. It can feel like it when we want to go back there and hang out with the corpse, but it truly doesn't. Behold, the new has come. The old has passed away. The new has come. 
I, there's no way that I can say this any better than that. Meditate on this verse. Memorize this verse. Speak this verse to yourself in answer to the devil's accusations. This shuts him up. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. But that's a big if. That is an important if. Make sure you're on the right side of that if. Verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled to us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God did it to us. God reconciled us to himself. Think about that. That's a profound sentence. When you guys get in a fight and somebody's done something terrible to you, and they're actively your enemy, from a human standpoint, it is very difficult for the person who is the victim and who is not in an enemy mode to reconcile with that other person. I'm currently being victimized by somebody. They currently are my enemy. How am I going to affect reconciliation when they're the ones attacking me? From an earthly standpoint, that is near impossible. Well, from an earthly standpoint, it is impossible. Christians can pull it off just as Christ pulled it off by being Christ taking it on the chin, turning the other cheek, walking the extra mile, allowing yourself to be persecuted for his name's sake. These are the things that produce change in other people in a way that makes no earthly sense. God reconciled us to himself through Christ, through the perfect sacrifice. That's our model. So that's sanctification, okay? Okay. Sanctification is the first part of this sentence. Verse 18a, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. But B, this, I'm sorry, that was uh, justification, salvation was the first part. The second part is discipleship. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Other than heaven, this verse contains everything you need to know about Christianity. Christ is how you get saved, and then God gives you a job to do. He gives you the power to do that job, but he gives you a job to do. Because how did you get saved? For very few of you do I suspect God blew you off your donkey on the road to Damascus and showed up in person. Perhaps, raise your hand if you were blown off a donkey. Okay, no one this time. Huh? Oh, there's one, Mike. <laughs> okay, that did kind of happen. <laughs> it, it did, it did kind of actually for you. Um, but generally speaking, we have another person in our life who was tasked with the ministry of reconciliation that brought us that word. God used them. He is saying, I need to use you too. Allow me. Paul goes on to explain it a little bit more. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So here's Paul basically saying the same thing again. He's making, using a few more words. But even Paul feels a need to reiterate Paul. So I feel okay. Secondly, he's saying the same thing twice. What does that mean? It's important. It's important. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. Were there trespasses? Yes. Was he counting them? No. Through Christ. So that exclusive verse that was our memory verse, where I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That way is an amazing way. That way is open to anybody who wants to come through. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We're going to come to that message of reconciliation. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation from verse 18 and the message of reconciliation from verse 19. The ministry is the job. The message is what you're doing with that job. I want you to go reconcile people to myself with this message of reconciliation. The gospel, the good news that Christ has died for your sins and put your crimes behind you and has taken them on you and you can be free if you choose to let him purchase you. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. 
Man, that word. We implore you. I beg you, please, don't die in your sins. Like, it shouldn't be too hard to convince people. But it sure was hard to convince me. Please, don't be tortured for all eternity and right now. Because that's the other thing. The Holy Spirit gives you payouts right now. You know that God is real because he's interacting with you. You have that supernatural peace. You have the ability to respond to circumstances in a way you never had before. Hey, but Satan pays out too. He gives you earthly coin and earthly power and internal misery right now. You can have internal misery and hunger that never ends and ruthlessness and selfishness. You want some of that? Do not regard according to the flesh. Because that's the only place Satan's lies pay out. We implore you, please. Now, this word. This word. Ambassador. This is an important word. This is a technical word. This is a word we still use today. I represent the government. I have the full authority of the government behind me. I can make treaties. I can arrange trade deals. I can exchange prisoners. I can involve one nation and another nation, whether in hostility or in peace. I have the full authority of the king. I have his message. The message that he has authorized me to give you. The terms of peace he's authorized, authorized me to extend to you. We are ambassadors for God incarnate. That's weighty. If you think about an ambassador now, and he goes over to North Korea, and he says, well, the American government wants me to kind of do this stuff, but I don't know. We can watch a basketball game. We can kind of hang out. If you are not spending your time as an ambassador actually doing your job, furthering the kingdom, you're in effect working against the kingdom. If God has put an ambassador in a country and that one guy's job is to do that one thing and he doesn't do that thing and nobody's doing that thing, you are making God's job harder. Now, I'm not saying anybody here is doing this, but it's important to take your job seriously. If this is in fact you, being an official emissary. And then he jumps back into the gospel again. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All right, here we have the justification. Okay, We are justified because he made him to be sin. And we might become, future tense, the righteousness of God. Here's glorification. If you read this whole section, the first third of the section is past tense. The middle third is present tense. And the third third is future tense of these verbs. God is talking about what I have done for you, what I am currently doing for you, and what I will do for you. All right. Now, chapter 6. We have to spend a little bit of time here. We've been nudging towards this. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. There is a weighty topic here that is so easily confused by so many people, not because it's particularly confusing, I think, itself, but because people generally sort of want to confuse it. Um, are you supposed to do works when you're a Christian? Yes. Do the works save you? No. But when you're saved, are works involved? Yes. But what if you don't do the works? Are you still saved? Yes. Should you do the works? Yes. Is Calvinism right? No. Calvinism's wrong. Is Arminianism right? No. Arminianism is wrong. They have some truth, so do the Buddhists. Stay on message. God will do a salvific work in you that you cannot do. He preordained you before the foundations of the world. He hand-selected you. This is a mystery. I do not understand why he picked me. Again, I wouldn't have. I'm glad he did, but he did. But was there a response that was made? Seemingly so, because they exhort us to make that response. Please, be reconciled, it says. I implore you. Well, if we had no choice, why would he implore us? That doesn't make any sense. So did God foreordain it? Yes. Do we also have a choice? Yes. I'm not going to get into the supernatural ways that this makes sense. But we have reason to believe that it's so. You clearly have free choice right now. You are aware that you do. Any philosophy that purports to tell you you cannot choose things is a stupid, stupid philosophy. 
why am I bothering telling it to you then? It doesn't make any sense if you can't choose it. So every Calvinist who's trying, well, you're preordained to not believe me, so I'm going to spend the next hour convincing you of why I'm right. You don't even believe you. So God is doing a work. The other side of this coin is that, well, now that I'm saved, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, that's true. What about your neighbor? Is he good? What about your brother? Is he good? What about your son? Is he good? Are they dying and you're watching them? I'm not saying you are, but if you are, God between you and evil. God has entrusted, given you a precious gift, the death and rebirth of his son, that message. He has given you a message to send to Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to all the ends of the earth, to your neighbor, to the people at work, to the people who will make fun of you. He has sent you to share the gospel with the people who will make fun of you. It's really interesting. I don't know the method that Kirk picks for doing the videos, but I didn't know what video was being shown this morning. And I saw it. I laughed. Okay. Is that... That guy's coming. <laughs> Actually, no, I wish he was. Because what will happen is... <sighs> Ephesians. Turn with me real quick to Ephesians. It's a couple books back. Or farther along, I should say. Ephesians 2. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are saved by grace through faith for works. God even set up the works. He prepared the works ahead of time. He just asks you to assent to his will and walk through them. There is a choice to be made, whether to accept his will or deny it. There is work to be done. That didn't save you. It will never save you. But it's one of the reasons God saved you. One of the reasons is you. The other reason is everyone else. There is, if God tells you to share the gospel with somebody, that's key. If, if God has told you to share the gospel with somebody, there is no justifiable reason not to, regardless of how you feel about it. Well, I can see that that young child is bleeding out on the side of the road, but I don't like blood. And off you walk. Whew. Answer to God on the day of judgment for that one. How much worse the, the death of the spirit than the death of the body. So uh, that was Ephesians 2. There's another one I'd like to look at. 1 Corinthians, back the direction we came. Chapter 3. That is your mandate, okay? Here's what happens if you don't do it and are saved, okay? You're still saved. You do not lose your salvation. So I'll give you a spoiler alert. You're fine. Don't panic. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is the foundation. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, what does this like specifically, actually, very particularly mean when we're in heaven? I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to know. Anyone who tells you they know is lying. But what I do know is that he is making a metaphor to illustrate a spiritual truth that if you have Jesus Christ as your foundation, you are saved and you will go to heaven. But if you do nothing with that, if you're just piling straw on top of that, yeah, you're going to be saved, but everything you've done is going to get burned up and you're going to survive barely as like somebody who escaped from the fire of their house and all their goods and all their clothes are burned up and they've got a licking. All right, you're saved, great. But everything you worked for is worthless, is what he is saying. 
You can spend your time here on earth building yourself a comfortable little hut for your own pleasure, safe in the knowledge that you escaped. Who cares about anybody else? And I'm pushing this as harshly as possible for the very few people that are doing this because it's important to come to grips with who we're choosing to be. Does this mean you've got to be out on the street corner every single day? No. Some days God tells you to eat food, and some days God tells you to sleep, and some days God tells you to sit back and play video games and relax or spend time with your family or go watch a football game or enjoy the fresh air that he's given you. That's all appropriate. But if that's all you do, if you have no ministry of reconciliation, then I promise you, you are either not saved or you are sitting on your foundation doing nothing. That's what Scripture says. I implore you. Back to our text. Whoa, where did this come from? Why did you guys not warn me it was doing that? You should have interrupted me rudely and said, hey, I know that's an important word from God, but come on, PowerPoint. You like my little words flying around? It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> it's fun. I was going to go, but I figured you guys wouldn't appreciate that because I don't. It would. It would make that noise. All right. This is a scary line. Working together with him. This is Paul speaking. I'm working with God. We appeal to you to not receive the grace of God in vain. In vain means pointlessly, fruitlessly, uselessly, worthlessly. Do not receive the grace of God worthlessly. You've received it. That's what this says. Therefore, you're saved. You've received the grace of God. But you've produced nothing of worth. You're saved, and that's one of the reasons he died on the cross. A very important reason. You are special. You are loved. You are his child. He loves you. He's so glad he saved you. But you're not the only child. It's not your birthday. It's not all about you. <laughs> yes. Yes, you're saved. Please, go rescue somebody. Please, they're dying. Receive the grace of God in vain. If you've received the grace of God, you're called a Christian, right? Why are we called Christians? Because we're after his name. All right, we're called by his name. That's what it says. If my people are called by my name. We've, in effect, taken on his name as the ambassador, right? We've taken his name. Please don't take his name in vain. That's a foundational commandment. Don't waste his time. He loves you. The reason he didn't rapture or execute you immediately upon salvation is because he has something for you to do. Again, the fact that you're still breathing gives me a clue. Either you're not saved and he is being oh so patient with you, sinner. Oh, so very patient, which may not last beyond the doors of this building. I kid you not. We all have stories of the loved one or the friend or the person we knew who just suddenly died. Sometimes by accident, sometimes by injury, sometimes for no apparent reason at all. You fool, Scripture says, this very night your life is demanded of you. If you are not yet saved, you are presuming much on the forbearance of God. Go read Jonathan Edwards' very brief, very powerful sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Keep in mind, he's holding your atoms together as you walk around the earth blaspheming and doing whatever you like. The minute he stops paying attention to you, you puff into pink mist. Please take this seriously. It's a little graphic, I know, I'm sorry. It's one of the Marines. It's hard to come out. For those of you who are saved, what an opportunity. God's mercy extends because think of all the damage we've done in our life. God says, okay, you broke that. And I know you like to do works. Now, you can't do works to fix yourself, but you can do works to fix them. He's not against works. Works are great. He wants you to get hands-on. He wants to give you the tools to do it. He wants you to produce something that makes you feel good about how you spent your day. He wants that. You're special. He wants to involve you in his special work. This is astonishing. There is no better feeling. Salvation was great. I loved salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. But sanctification is better. Sanctification is every day, all day, as I transform from a robot into a human... No, wait, different show. As I transform <laughs> from a sinner into a saint, more and more like the image of Christ every single day. Don't get excited about Transformers, children. <laughs> this is why I say myself very close to you. <laughs> All right. 
Still on the right slide? Good. Last verse, for he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This quote in your Bibles is probably italicized and set off from the rest of the text. It is from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. I'm not going to read it right now. I recommend going and reading that whole chapter. As I suspected when I saw this, I went back to check. It is a messianic chapter. It's a chapter speaking about Jesus. Specifically, it's a message about Jesus, God saving the whole world, including Gentiles. All right, just out of curiosity, um, is there anyone here who is Jewish by, by birth, by, by nationality, or by descent? No? Okay, you're all Gentiles. Don't know if you knew that or not. Okay. You're what they call the barbarians in the Bible, and I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> God didn't pick the Israelites because he's the o- they're the only ones he loved. He picked them as an example to the rest of the world. God didn't pick you because you're the only one he loved. He picked you as an example for the rest of the world. Not just an example of how you live your life. That's hard enough, I admit. Do that, yes. But don't do the one while neglecting the other. You actually have to say things. You actually have to go out of your way. You actually have to leave your comfort zone. Or you have to come face to face with yourself. At least do this much. At the end of the night, if you realize that you didn't come out of your comfort zone, I want you to say out loud to yourself so your own ears can hear. Maybe even to another person, I value my own comfort over somebody else's salvation. If that's true of yourself tonight, then say it. Own it. Do yourself the honor and the respect of not lying to yourself. God's not telling you to talk to everyone all the time about everything, but I promise you he's asking you to talk to somebody about something. If you're not, find out why not. If it's because you don't feel like it, then either own that or overcome that. If it was something that we could feel our way to, if holiness was what we felt, we'd all be chasing that instead of Disney-like dreams or drugs or fame or Instagram likes. Sin is what we feel like chasing. Holiness is what we never feel like chasing. I never want to come to church. Newsflash. Never. Especially when I'm teaching. Oh man, I definitely got no excuse today. I still come because I know that when I get here, the holiness comes. The blessing comes. But lying in bed in the morning, I'm like, oh, if only I could just play video games all day. That would be far preferable to coming and being holy and hanging out with you people. And that's the tone of voice I say it in. Like this, I talk to myself. God makes this ever so slightly difficult. He makes you not wanna. Really? That's generally the only obstacle you face in your faith, to be honest. I feel mildly uncomfortable about this. Ooh, the persecution. There are times when it's harder than that. You know what? In my own experience, it almost seems like that's easier. Like, I can overcome those deathly situations. Like, I've got to trust God in this circumstance. The blood is spilling and the people are screaming, it's God. Like, but I'm comfortable now. Well, perhaps God isn't so important. I don't know why we're like that. I'm like that. I presume you're like that. Humans are like that. Choose. Choose to not be like that. What's that? Video games can be both a blessing and a curse. But they can also be a blessing. Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Or is it? If you're not saved, this might be the day. Yesterday, as you know, is a memory. You cannot go back and change anything. Neither can it come up here and get you. It is sealed off for all time. Tomorrow is not promised. It is imaginary. You hope. You have statistical evidence. Every day before this was like this. Tomorrow probably will be. You may be right. You don't know. I'll tell you one thing. You can't have any relationships in the past or in the future. You can't interact with your wife in the past, and you can't interact with your wife in the future. You can't reach your children then, nor can you talk to God then. Now, God's outside of time. He's interacting with you in the past and the future. He's got this, but you can't. You're time-bound right now. 1159, 
on this Sunday is the only opportunity you have to talk to God. Maybe you'll get another now. Maybe you won't. If you are lost, now is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not the day of salvation. Tomorrow is the day that perhaps you face your maker. If you are saved, now is somebody's day of salvation, which means now is the day where God gave you the message to say it, perhaps, to this person. Now, I can't say to you who that person is or when that time is. I know what the message is, but I don't know who and when. But if you are in the habit of resisting God's instruction, if you are in the habit of not listening to him in this area, you will miss it. And their day of salvation will pass and they will die in their sins and they will go to hell. Is it possible that someone could die because you didn't say anything and go to hell because you didn't say anything? People are dying and going to hell all the time. Now I know that God will give them the message. Those that need to hear, God will let them hear some way. But man, I don't know how this works. I do know that you're called to say. I do know that there are certain times. I do know that's important. I do know that you can build a house on this foundation. Chris, scripture says all that. I don't know how that guy that passes in front of you will be saved or not. But if you're called to do it, then I know you're called to do it. Scripture also talks about the messenger. To a prophet, God said, if you speak the truth, this man, he rejects the truth and he dies, then that's his own fault. But if you, speak, if you do not speak the truth, this man, he dies in his sins, then I will hold you accountable for his blood. And rightfully so. Ambassadors work for the kingdom. Ambassadors share the message. We are ambassadors. Please, if you are not saved, now is the day of salvation. Please, if you are, pursue relationship with Christ. He'll take care of the details. He'll work it all out. Just pursue him. He'll make the work happen. He'll give you the tools. He will transform you from the inside out. I promise you, it's an amazing, wonderful experience. You want this. And all, be encouraged. There is even better things await where it's not even difficult where it's so easy to be perfect. There's no other option. We're going to have rest. We're going to have peace. We're going to have joy. Work now while it's daylight. The end is coming for all of us. Work now. Let's pray. Father God, let this be a message of hope and encouragement, not shame and guilt. Lord, if there's any shame or guilt, let the enemy be banished from this room. This isn't about shame or guilt, but if there is responsibility, let us feel the weight of that. If there is failure that can be corrected, Lord, encourage us to correct. All the enemy does is accuse. You say, this is wrong, and here's how you fix it. That's conviction. If there is conviction here today, Lord, then let it be felt, and let us internalize it, and let us make the positive decision to do differently. And strengthen us in that decision, Lord God. Encourage us in that decision. Holy Spirit, be here today. Let this be a message of encouragement. Remind us of all the good works that we have done. Stir in us the heart to continue to do them. And remind us of the coming glory so that the pains of this world are like nothing. For all of your people, your brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the room here, Lord, that are, that are seeking relationship with you on a daily basis, who are already doing these things, encourage them, Lord. Let them know that any condemnation is not for me and is not from you. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, period. However, if there are some here who are not saved, this is nothing but condemnation. Lord, free them. Show them the freedom they have from this. This golden rope is extended to them. It's their choice whether they choose to be pulled out of the muck and the mire. Lord, call to them. If you are not saved in this room right now, you do not need to do anything special. Nobody needs to know. But I pray that in your heart, you fall before the Christ, fall before the Messiah, fall before Jesus. Accept his offer. Acknowledge that you have sinned against God and that you can't fix yourself. And ask Jesus to take that for you. Right here, right now, in your own heart, in the privacy of your own mind. Be saved now, for you are not promised a then. And as we go out into the world, Lord, as your ambassadors, your emissaries, your messengers, the one carrying this precious treasure, please let us not keep it locked up under a bushel basket for no one else to see. Please, God, give us this, the, the poke, the prod, the encouragement, whatever. Whatever it takes to save somebody else's life, Lord. Let us not be so focused on ourselves, our own desires, our own fears, our own busyness. 
to neglect the reason we still draw breath. To love you and love everybody else. You'll handle loving us. That's not our job. But let us make that our focus today and every moment we continue to exist on this earth. In your most holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen.